Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we conclude with Part 8, The Last of the Shamans from the Ways of the Lonely Ones by Manly P. Hall. The Last of the Shamans, an American Indian allegory. The majority of the white race know little, if anything, of the American Indian, of his ideals, his hopes and fears, for there are few indeed who can pierce the stoic attitude of these people who, while they are fast dying, still preserve the dignity and self-control which mark all the elder nations. From early childhood, I mingled more or less with this strange, broken people, a scattered remnant of what was once the most powerful of all races. There is something very wonderful and fascinating in the study of the Indian. An invisible cord, a mystic bond, drew me even in my childhood to these nomadic people, and I spent many years in the study of their customs. I have seen young braves covered from head to foot with yellow ochre or green and blue aniline dye, dashing madly on half-broken broncos and Indian ponies down the main street of a town, shouting and screaming their war cries in a truly terrible, yet wonderfully fascinating manner. I have stood beside tall, blanketed figures in the drugstores as they spent the money gained from horse selling and cattle raising for various colored pigments with which to smear their bodies. I have stood on the street corner where the squaws sat, surrounded by pottery and beadwork fashioned by their skillful fingers, crying out the value of their wares or cooing cradle songs to the little papooses fastened by thongs to their beds of wood. Of white men, there are but few who concern themselves as to the fate of the Indians. The pale face can scarcely be blamed, for he does not know the beauty, the sweetness, and the deep mysticism of their ancient but now broken ideals. Every race, like every individual, plays its part in the great plan, and its work done vanishes from the sight of men. In his soul, the Indian knows that the course of his race is run, and while his heart is sad still, the voice within whispers, and the old brave realizes that the great spirit is calling his children home from the corners of creation. Calmly and serenely, the aged warrior, philosopher, or statesman gathers the folds of his blanket around him and walks along the way that leads to Manitou the Mighty. It was in a small town in one of the western states that I met probably the strangest Indian in the world. He always reminded me of that wonderful character created by Eugene Sue in The Wandering Jew, for it honestly seemed that this Indian had lived forever. Nobody knew where Uncle Joe came from, but some of the old timers remarked that they guessed God made him with the country. Everyone agreed that he was more than a hundred, but no one seemed to know just how much more and he never answered personal questions. When you asked him, he would only grunt and wrap his blanket more closely about his face. There were very few people who were friendly with Uncle Joe, for he was a strange, lonely wanderer, reminiscent of the age when the Red Man was in his glory. He still wore the picturesque garb of his people. His face was wrinkled and copper-colored, and his heart was of pure gold. He was no fool either, was Uncle Joe, nor was he lacking in education, for he spoke better English than the white men who scorned him. It seemed he had traveled widely also, for he could tell you of distant countries, and he spoke a dozen or more foreign languages. A polished gentleman in temperament and nature, he seemed a strange misfit among a rabble of half-breeds. Some said he was a great chief, others that he was the medicine man for a once mighty people, while the eternally suspicious ones whispered that he was a secret agent for the government. But when it came right down to facts, all admitted that they did not know anything about Uncle Joe. Every few weeks he would mount his little Indian pony and ride out all alone into the barren desert dotted with mesas and shapeless crags which lay to the south of the town. Everyone wondered where he went and often tried to follow him. They would get just so far, however, each time and then he would vanish as though the earth had swallowed him up and no one had ever found the secret which Uncle Joe guarded somewhere out among the painted rocks. I lived in the little town many months studying the Indian, and my love and admiration for his race must have been felt by Uncle Joe, for he became very friendly with me, and we had many talks about the Red Man, his history, his government, and his philosophy. Uncle Joe was no ordinary Indian, as I have intimated, but a real scientist and philosopher. In the course of about three years, I became his closest companion. We were together nearly all the time, except when he went out into the desert. Then he would say, I go into the hills. Someday I shall take you with me, but not now. So the time passed, and I learned much of the history of the Red Man, 
his secret customs, his religion, and his great ideals. Uncle Joe would sigh as he told me of the dead ambitions of his race, and now and then a tear would steal softly down his cheek when he spoke of the way of the great spirit and of the gods who had come to care for and instruct his people. One day, as the third year of our acquaintance was drawing to a close, Uncle Joe laid his hand on my shoulder and his great black eyes seemed to look into my very soul. I am going out into the desert, he said, and I shall never come back again, for my gods have called me and my father's fathers have whispered to me in the night. In all the years that have passed, I have never taken anyone with me on this journey. But today my gods have spoken and said that one at least of the coming race should know the secret of my dying people. So if you wish to go with me out into the desert, you may, and there you will discover the reason why Uncle Joe has been here all these years and why no man has ever followed him. I gladly accepted the opportunity, for I knew that there was some great secret that the old Indian had been guarding. And so the next morning we started out together on two little pinto ponies toward the broken ground which lay to the south. As we rode along, Uncle Joe told me some wonderful things about the Indians. Some of them I am not allowed to tell, but others I may relate. He said that among the red men was a mystic group who for thousands of years had kept the records of these wandering people. Little was known concerning them. They were hidden from even the Indians themselves, for they were a secret order appointed by the great spirit to labor with his children. This little band of sacred ones had come from the silent east, from the place of the rising sun. They came from a wondrous city of shining lights that had vanished forever beneath the waters of the mighty ocean. They were the priests of Malkadek, the priest king of the ancient red men, arrayed in robes of birds' feathers and shining gold, possessors of the wealth of the emperors and the wisdom of gods. These strange masters had brought out of the Dawnland the knowledge of the great spirit and had formed the Indians into seven great nations like the planets in the heavens. For thousands of years, these wise men had labored with the Indians who before that time had been a nomadic race dwelling on the outskirts of a more ancient civilization they had brought with them along the path of the sunbeam the great serpent of wisdom and had guarded the red man's destiny all through the years of his development. But now the red man's work was done, the man who was calling his people and the great spirit had given to his sons the work of gathering in his broken tribes as the harvester gathers in his grain. I listened while the old man spoke. It was all very wonderful to me to hear such words as these from the mouth of one whom the world called a savage. Yet I realize more plainly than ever that the world has little power to judge as to who are its philosophers. We had been riding some time and slowly about us rose up the rugged walls bearing the marks of water on their rough-hewn sides, showing that once a vast ocean had carved them by its ebb and flow. But now all was dry and dead, and here and there the whitened bones of animals showed that water was but a memory of the past. We were on a narrow trail that wound in and out among the reddish rocks and shifting sands. Suddenly before us rose a mighty pinnacle of sandstone, and the twisting path seemed to end at its base. The aged Indian stopped, raised his hand and muttered a few words in his strange guttural language, at the same time making the mark of the cross upon his forehead. As he did so, the rocks dissolved and a gateway appeared in the great sandstone mountain. Motioning me to enter the mystic arch, Uncle Joe followed. Darkness surrounded us, for the rock door closed behind us, leaving no mark upon the outer wall. For many hundreds of years, whispered my companion, this rocky cavern has remained unknown to the white man, for in it are buried the secrets of a lost people. There are few who know the mysteries of my race. Even the young brave growing up has forgotten, and will never again think of the powers of his sires. I remained spellbound at the miracle, for up to that time I had never believed in supernatural things, but as we rode slowly along in the gloom, a strange feeling of awe and reverence for my companion came over me. Who are you? I asked. Who have these strange powers and know so much of these ancient people? My guide made no answer, but we continued on through the gloom until we finally emerged into the light on a beautiful little plateau high upon the side of a lofty mesa. From this vantage point, we saw spread out below us a great expanse of rolling and uneven country which stretched out to the distant mountains a mass of brown and yellow in strange relief against the glorious blue of the summer sky. 
The old Indian waved his hand. Behold the land of the red men, now a desert. Water alone made this a fertile country, and the waters of life pouring out from the heart of the Great Spirit alone made the red men a great race. No longer do the waters come forth, for the work of the red man is done, and soon he will be as lifeless and broken as the desert which stretches before you. But come, my son, child of another people, you are the first white man who has ever lived to enter the presence of the red man's God. Taking me by the hand, Uncle Joe guided me to a small opening in the side of the cliff, just a narrow slit which led into unknown depths. I passed in and the Indian followed me. After going a hundred feet or so into the mountain, the crevice broadened out and became a great room dimly lighted by a blazing fire of mighty logs. Of living inmates, there was no sign but the whole room was filled with ghostly figures. In a great circle sat a row of mummies robed from head to foot in the grandeur of the red man, preserved against decay by some unknown element in that subtle atmosphere. Twelve sat cross-legged upon the floor, and in the center of this ghostly circle was a great throne before which burned a fire of undying grandeur. The throne was empty and seemed of solid gold with a glorious sun globe and the thunderbird carved upon its back. These, my son, are chiefs of the Red Man. They were the last of the line of priest kings who dwelt here and who came out of the land of the sky blue waters. One by one they have passed beyond to the land of their ancestors. Each time one of these great ones died, the power of the Manitou was cut off from a tribe of the Red Men. One after another they have been brought here, and in the heart of this mountain of red sandstone they sit, Mute examples of faithfulness to the end, they were the order of Malkadek, the priest sachems of the nomadic people of the world. Here you see all that is left of them, my son. Their spirits have returned to the Great Father, for their work is done. Their children cry in the wilderness, for the Manu has called them, and one by one they join that silent throng, passing over to the Blessed Isle. No longer can the hands of the gods lead them, they are gathered in and taken over to another shore, when someday they will come forth again a mighty people. The old Indian leaned heavily on my arm while he was speaking, and slowly we went out again into the sunshine of the day. We sat down upon the ground near the edge of the cliff and talked for many hours. He told me of the past glories of his dying people and begged that someday I would reveal them to my world. The shades of evening fell and the short purple twilight that divides the day from the desert night hung over the plains and prairies that stretched out before us. The evening star rose, a glorious light in the heavens, and the whole world seemed to sleep save when the howl of a coyote broke the silence. The old Indian pointed to the gathering clouds, whispering, look. While I did so, a great procession seemed to form out of the must and crossing the sky in endless train, vanished where the last dull gleams marked the setting sun. They are the dying ones, whispered my companion, and I am one of them. Each night as I sit alone or wander in the desert, I can see my people passing slowly by. Long ago I buried my race, and out there in the desert, only a few broken sticks mark their resting places. No longer does the smoke rise from their campfires, no longer do the wigwams dot the plains, never again will the red man hunt the bison, no more will he stand at sunrise on the mountain peak to worship the great spirit. See them, my son, see them, chief and priest, brave and squaw, sweeping on in an endless file to the home of the gods. Just a few short years and they will be no more. Their work is done. Why should they stay? Remember, my son, they go not like slinking coyotes in the night, like cowards creeping away from the field of battle. They go like kings and emperors. They go not as failures to chastisement by their gods, but as those who have finished claiming their rewards. The white man will never know the red man, for the white race has made us a stranger in the land of our birth, nameless vagabonds in the beautiful world created for us. But it is well, for as today the red man sinks away into the eternal night, so shall the white man, when his day is done, pass silently to rest. While he was speaking, the endless procession swept across the sky. There were mighty chieftains in robes of wampum and with war bonnets of eagle feathers, braves on desert ponies, squaws and children, medicine men wearing the heads of buffaloes, and priests with their feathered staves, a ghostly file of spectres in triumphant march, all with heads up, shoulders erect, eyes to the front. 
The old Indian beside me gazed longingly at the moving throng and pointed upward to the stars. Look, my son, my people's campfires are burning in the heavens. I followed his fingers with my eyes, and I beheld in the sky millions of little campfires stretched out as far as the eye could see, millions of little teepees flowing in the ethers and the dull murmur as of reverent prayer. That, my son, whispered the old Indian, is the bivouac of the dead. I can see them every night. When the shades of evening fall, the braves dash across the sky, hunting buffalo or float in their beautiful canoes down the river of stars. Still again through the night, there comes to me the plaintive wail of the moon lute as the Indian youth plays his love melodies, and I see the smoke of the signals on the hills and hear the ancient war drums booming. Once again, the braves gather to listen to the words of their chieftains. It is all gone now, my son, but still it lives in the world of spirit, and there it is eternal. I am old, for I have lived since the red man was born. I was with him in the days of his youth. I was with him in the years of his glory. And one by one, I have laid his wisest to rest. From the mighty land of the Sioux, from the tribes of the Algonquins, from the Muscogean and the wandering Iroquois, even to the distant Shoshoneans, I am known. Each time one of the great ones has died, it is I who in the silence of the night have walked from mountain top to mountain top with his body in my arms. I've brought him here to the cave of the sandstone mountains in whose darkness my secret shall be locked forever. Never until the time when Manitou the mighty shall roll away these mountains shall the 12 priests of Malkadec be found for no white man shall desecrate them. No curious eyes shall behold their forms. No heathen laugh shall awaken their slumbers. No vandalizing grave robbers shall in the name of science disturb their resting place. Your people may search through the seven worlds, but they will never find the secret of the red man. For passing silently into the great beyond, he carries with him the truths of his creation. The years draw nigh when the end is at hand. I know, for I am the spirit of the red man. None know where I came from, for I came not. I am. None know where I shall go, for I go not. I am. Each of my red brothers who is laid to rest has knowledge of me. I feel his presence and part of my soul joins with his. One by one they pass away, the young braves live other lives, and the red man is forgotten. Now the twelve are here, for in the silence of the night I brought the last. My people shall wander for a little while upon the earth, but their spirit is gone, gone back across the great waters to the Father to wait until the appointed day when they shall come forth again on other wheels as new nations. Now the red man is ruled by the spirit of the white man and he bows to the white man's God. It is well for all things are the will of the great spirit and the father of fathers whose home is by the great waters where he watches the tiny grains of sand that are dashed upon the seashore. But the order of Malkadec is no more. A few scattered seekers there are among my people, but they wander in darkness, for in this cave is sealed forever the order of the kings. The tears were rolling down my cheeks while he told me his pathetic story. And yet, it is a grand story. The story which is written in the soul of every red man, unless his tired heart has found rest under the banner of the white king. At last I spoke, you say you have lived through all the ages of the red man? The old warrior nodded his head. I have lived with them, and my son, I shall die with them, for they are my chosen people. I came to them with the glory of the sun as it rose a ball of fire from the silver waters. I fought with them through the storms of winter and loved with them through the calm of summer. And now that the son of the red man is sinking and the last of the vanishing race is being led silently to rest, I go with them. Their sun will rise some day in a distant land, and there shall be once more the spirit of the sunrise, as now I am the over-brooding angel of the night. This is the message of the red men, a people who in years that are past ruled the world, whose libraries and universities were the glory of creation, whose scientists were the marvels of men, whose doomed temples and mystic arches rose to the skies in every land on earth. Listen, a voice calls from within. It is the voice of the ages. For the pyramid builders speak through me this night. The pharaohs of Egypt are still alive in my blood. The phantom of the man who he too is with me and in my soul is the heart of the dying Montezuma. Amid the Andes, through the mystic caverns of the Sierra Madre, 
Among the Everglades that border the shores of Okeechobee, along the silent Nile where the great stone faces gaze peacefully through the night, I wander, and I am one with them. Yes, I am the spirit of the red men. You ask who I am, that has been asked before. Once I answered, I am the morning star. Later I replied, I am the star that shines with the glory of the sun. Still later, as my people sank to rest, I was the evening star that whispered of eternal peace. Now I am the spirit of the night, and you may call me silent voice, for I speak and there are none to hear my words. I am the last of the shamans, the last of the priest kings who came out of the lost Atlantis. I am the last who was ordained in the temple of the rising sun. I am the last to bear the mark of the serpent. While speaking, he dropped his blanket, and there over his heart and twined upward across his chest was a strange serpent tattooed in vivid pigments. That is the mark of Malkadek, he whispered, a mark no living man knows from one end of the world to the other. It is the mark of Quetzalcoatl, the mark of the feathered serpent who is dead forever. I am the last living thing to bear that mark which was placed there four million years ago. I stared at the Indian as if doubting his words, but looking into those terrible eyes of living fire, I realized that I was not gazing at a man, but at a god. Wait a few minutes, he whispered, rising, then come back into the cave, for there are other things I would that you should know. He left me looking up at that endless procession of figures that still crossed the skies as silently as the stars in their courses. I waited for several seconds, and then a voice whispered to me to rise and enter. As I did so, I gave a startled cry. On the great throne, surrounded by the twelve dead, sat the aged Indian we knew as Uncle Joe. He was robed from head to foot in the garb of the red man, covered with jeweled ornaments and the finest wampum. His bronze body shone in the flickering light of the ever-burning fire, and his war bonnet of eagle feathers reached nearly to the floor. On his forehead was a cross of living gold, and from his breast the snake gleamed forth in vari-colored lights, while the feathered staff he carried as a scepter swayed slightly with the movements of his arms. My son, the last of the red men, the last of the priests, has been called to rest. They were my kingdom, and now I am an emperor of the dead. You will see me no more, for I go to the land of the setting sun. The Manitou has called me, and I obey. But remember, there is no death. I go on to other labors in other lands, for I am the spirit of the red man, and I can never die, but shall live on forever to guard the destinies of my people who, while their race is broken, must continue their endless pilgrimage through space, until the day when the All-Father calls home even Manitou the Mighty. Somewhere in the bounds of the infinite we shall meet again, you and I, for you too are chosen of your gods. When your race is drawn silently into the unknown, I shall ask the Manitou the privilege of being there that I may greet another people coming home. The fire that has burned for ages will soon go out, and with it vanishes the last of the Red Men. No more will the world see me, for on this throne I sit awaiting the last of my people. Though years may pass before they gather, I shall be sitting here, surrounded by the dead. So as you go out into the world and people ask you what has happened to Uncle Joe, just tell them he is waiting, waiting through the hours of the night, waiting with the jury of the dead, waiting for the last log to burn. In the ages that are past, I said that I would become strong and worthy to be given charge of the Red Men. In many worlds and for many ages, I have fulfilled that trust, even until today. So here I shall wait in the cave, for the time is not long. Already the Great Spirit is calling me from somewhere over the distant hills, and even while I speak, another Red Man's soul passes me on the way to rest. I wait as some time you must wait for the whispers of the dying. Here I remain until the last great day when I shall seal the book of my works and return to my Maker. Farewell. You have heard my words. Never seek me again, for no man shall know where I have gone, but remember that my spirit waits in the silence of this cave in the heart of the sandstone mountain. When they come, I shall gather them lovingly to rest, and then with the spirit of the twelve priests of Malkadek, I shall go before my Creator with the glory of a million emperors, the power of kings, and the light of the rising sun and the serpent of wisdom, I, whom the world knows only as Uncle Joe, the last of a dying race, the last of the red men. 
Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.